So what's going on? What do you guys, uh, let's just pray real quick. Father, we thank you for this time together. We just thank you that um, we're not trying to get your spirit to come, but your spirit's here. And that uh, it could just minister to, to everyone's heart, everything that they need. Thank you, Father, for your love for us. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. So does anybody have anything? Perhaps, perhaps our Father's leading us to another place. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. It could be. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah. Anybody, anybody, keep your eye out for spots that you see. I was a look. I'm always looking. You know. Um, I mean, in here it was like eight thousand square feet, but no. I mean, what we need is all relative to what we can get for what price. You know what I'm saying? Um, probably can't go. I mean, I think the lowest I was reasonably looking at was like three thousand square feet. That's the lowest I'll probably even bother to go and look. But I found a little place that says it's already set up for a church, and it was like 3,300 square feet. So I'm at least going to go look, right? But probably below that isn't worth going to look at. But four to six is ideal. Yeah, because we got a lot of children's church stuff stored everywhere. How's it going, Mr. Walt? Good morning. Sorry. No, no, that's all right. We're going to leave those doors open, though, so... We didn't miss, you didn't miss anything, man. So other than the building, does anybody have anything going on in their life? Or, well, I know we all got things going on in our life, but that you want to talk about or that you got questions about or just thoughts or just something that you've been thinking about with God that you just want to bust out onto the table. Yeah, I, would, I would like to say something. Uh, you know, that, that guy was telling me about, I got this guy and uh, I guess there's a lot of background information you have to know to understand what I'm saying. But, I mean, y'all can all relate. And this guy, you know, I was in Teen Challenge with this guy. I knew the type of, of and there, out there, there's a lot of different people believing. You got people who believe in word of faith. You got people that don't believe it. You got Calvinists. You got, you know, it's all different types. And, uh, he was leaning more towards like a Calvinistic, a reformed persuasion. And so I know like how these guys believe. You know what I mean? And he had left Team Challenge and then or he got out of Team Challenge and then you know, it just I had talked to him while I was in Team Challenge. Before he was a before he was really sure about what really to believe, you know what I mean? Because you're inundated with all these different. And I was just telling him about grace and, and whatnot, trying to, to keep him away from that Calvinist. Because I didn't know a lot, but I knew that wasn't it. But uh, anyway, he went back. He ended up, I guess, messing up and ended up going back to, to um, go back to work at Team Challenge. Because you can always, if you graduate, you can always go back there. And work there and uh anyway man i just seen him he you know he started to post stuff on facebook come across my feet like spiritual things you know what i mean and the, and the lord i just kind of felt like i should reach out to him you know but i didn't really know how to because i know what he's believing you know what i mean and it's crazy when you have people that believe you know and it's so hard to explain this because if you don't know what Calvin, a Calvinistic belief is, you know, that basically all men are evil and we have to trust in we are nothing without God. It's just, it's a crazy belief, man. But um, anyway, I've been trying to get him, I've been, I sent him some messages on the true nature of men. And then uh, he, uh, you know, it's like, how do you even communicate with these people? You know what I mean? It's like, like you say, it's like speaking Chinese. <laughs> like you, you get, you, you know what I mean? You could tell them, you could be the saying the same thing that they're saying. It's, it's like they say, yeah, you know, like for instance, he says, I believe that all men are born at odds with God, 
That's why God sent Jesus to redeem them. And we believe the same thing, but it's the why. Why did why was man born at odds? Why did man need to be redeemed? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it's hard, it's hard, man. And you even have people in your own uh, your own family, your own life, they 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 see you not really fellowshipping with them anymore and and the way they believe, you know what I mean? Like you move, they, and they think you're moving on into something weird and crazy. Yeah. Into this yeah. grace thing. Yeah. You know well, what I mean? I, can I? Yeah, sure. yeah. I'm I'm, I can tell you that most Christians believe that we're born with evil natures. That was how I first began to believe and understand. That we are born with an evil nature. And that that evil nature has to be dealt with. And when that is completely and fully ingrained in you, and they show you from the scriptures, scriptures that sound very much like that, yeah. because there are scriptures that sound very much like that, those scriptures are then used to develop a philosophy or an idea about you, and it, it, it declares something about you that you are evil and God needs to make you good. And uh, so once that's in you and you're thinking like that, when someone says, no, you do not have an evil nature, you are, you know, you were born in the very image of God and there is something in our belief system that needs to be changed and, and that is what we need to be redeemed from. We have something that is oppressing us and keeping us, you know, under sin that needs to be dealt with that whereby we can be redeemed and saved from that thing. It's not that we are evil, at least the essence of who we are is not evil, but it is something that we're believing that we need to be saved from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is the misunderstanding that exists because when you've been taught a certain way your whole life and it's ingrained in you, it's very hard to just hear something else and just accept it. Yeah. Cognitive it's dissonance. It's understandable. It's Cognitive very understandable. Dissonance. You know, so what happens. The sensitivity in how you deal with that, you have to have sensitivity because yeah. they are just believing what they know, what, yeah. they, what they have been taught. I'd like to say something directly yes. to his answer. I have a, a close friend who's a Calvinist, and he would pound me with, with stuff, with Piper and some of the even better Calvinists, you know, but so they still have that mindset, you know, uh, but they think they know what grace is, but what, what I found out is they just send him a few of Greg's messages and don't say anything. And slowly the light has come into the darkness, and at least he's quitting, he's not sending me any more of that stuff. <laughs> so, you know, you walk into a, do a totally black, dark room with one candle and light it, that, that light will fill all the darkness. And that's what that sensitivity is, you know, yeah, that, that just, you don't have to don't, convince somebody. I, yeah, don't that. argue with them. I just send him one of Greg's messages. Well, and, and, yeah. and real quick, also to speak to that, and the guy didn't just accept, didn't just get quiet at first. He kept coming back. Right. It's just that I happen to talk about more things than most people spend time talking about in right. great detail. So I've answered all the questions they think they have that I can't answer. Right. I've gone back and answered them. Yeah. Um, but what I would encourage you to do, um, and something I do when I have a friend or a person I have a, a relationship with somehow that is believing something that I, I, I believe to be a contradiction to the gospel. The way I try to engage them is in, in, in that one aspect of what they believe. Like, for, for example, I had a friend that was a Calvinist, and one of the main aspects of their belief is the depravity of man. Right? And so instead, so instead of coming to the guy and, and saying, man wasn't depraved, based on my definition of it, right? I, did, I skipped over that, and I just started talking about what the depravity of man would be, right? And from that foundation, I just asked questions. Right? And just pose thoughts. Well, have you ever wondered if it's really blah, 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 blah? And then just leave it. Like, um, I did a whole message about the heart of man is abundantly wicked. 
And to see, that's one of the main Calvinist verses. And I did a whole message about that. And that's kind of how I engaged my friend with, from that foundation. I began just having a conversation with him about what does it mean that man's heart was abundantly wicked, right? What does that mean? And I just began a dialogue about that one topic and where we were just going back and forth about that one thing. As it pertains to Calvinism, that's quite a big thing to have straightened out in their thinking or at least for them to go on seeing what that means. And you have a great grasp of um, what it means that man took on a, a wicked belief system that was contrary from God that could never give life, that, could, could, that gives death. You, you have a great understanding of that. So it would be easy for you to engage. It's hard when you're doing Facebook Messenger. Oh, yeah, that part's hard. But you could like, just... Do not talk. This guy, man, after I, I sent him a... I sent him a last, the last message I sent him oh, about the, he, he couldn't understand what was the difference in being a child of God and a son of God. Yeah. Now we're all, every man is a child of God, but all are not believing into the spirit of life. He couldn't understand that. All don't call God Abba, yeah. right? Which is what it means to have the spirit of the son dwelling but, in man, you. But after, where is that man? He, he shut down on me. He sent me sent me this message and he was like he was like man I really appreciate your heart because I could have come out on any of his Facebook posts and just in front of all his friends and just shut him down you know what I mean but I private messaged him and was like hey man I just want to reason with you but he's like you want to debate reform theology I'm like I don't want to debate anything (laughs) I just want to go through the scriptures and kind of see and, and, and he messaged me back. He's like, I really appreciate your heart, but I don't understand why you want me to see this new truth. You know what I mean? Like he said, I have a good, a great understanding of the gospel. And I'm thinking, oh, that, that, <laughs> that alone, you know, this saying that you don't know the gospel. I, w- I, w- I wouldn't even, he, he doesn't need to understand it. I would say you felt something in your heart from God to share with this guy because you love him. I, I think you did. And I, I, what I would say is don't underestimate the seed that's been sown oh, and yeah, that the yeah. Spirit is going to be, be talking with him about the things in those messages and the things you brought up. And he's already asking questions because he asked you. I don't understand why you brought me this. The, do you see how he already has a question in his head? He's, search, he's going to be searching for answers. And now you can just let the Spirit do its work. And you that's know? one thing I've learned, man. That it's not... The burden is upon me to convince him of anything. Yeah. You know, all I can do is present the truth, and the truth will have to work. That's right. Upon him. You, you may find this hard to believe, and I promise you I'm not lying. I was talking to God about John Calvin yesterday. <laughs> and here's what I heard John is so sorry about what he taught people. Just yesterday. Mm-hmm. And people took what he taught and ran with it. And he's sorry he taught it. I even heard stories on Just his deathbed. He Why would I be changed. thinking about John Calvin? Mm-hmm. That's so, good. Calvinism goes way beyond John Calvin. That's the problem. Well, that's right. That's why he's sorry the people he's took what he said for him. Hyper Calvinism. And, and, yeah. and for those of you that don't know anything about Calvinism, there's, there's different ideas of Calvinism. One of the main ideas, though, is limited atonement, predestination. God pre picked some people for hell and some people for heaven. And Jesus' atonement wasn't for the world. It was only for the select elect, right? So it wasn't the lamb who took away the sin of the world. It was the lamb who took away the sin of the elect, right? Because not one drop of his blood can be wasted. Right, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Only so those he died for will be saved. And those who aren't saved, he didn't die for. That's right. And, and, and so the... The, 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 it's, it's a misunderstanding of the plight of man. I love what Maurice said. All people are born as the image of God. But if you notice in Genesis, it talks about something called image and likeness. In our image, after our likeness. Okay? Those are, that's a very big point. So all people are born in the image of God. When Paul went on Mars Hill in Acts 17, he talked about everyone being the offspring of God. He was talking to pagans and that were worshiping other gods. And he, they had a statue to the unknown God. And he said, I see that you have a statue to the unknown God. I'm here to tell you about that God. 
Inasmuch as we are all the offspring of this God, he said. He said we're all the offspring of God. So what he's saying is, is every human being has been created and born in the image of God. But God isn't just interested in us being born in his image. He's interested in us being wrapped in his light in his life. He's interested in us being glorified immortal just like him. Now, the only way that can happen is through persuasion or through belief, through us allowing him to deposit his spirit into our hearts, meaning we believe on him for life. Right. And then his spirit dwells in our heart and then his spirit gets busy giving birth to his life in us. And then ultimately it will glorify us immortal just like it did with Jesus. So in the beginning, when God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, that's what he's always been busy with. That's what he's still busy with. All people are his image, but now he's trying to create them after his likeness. And his likeness was seen in the resurrected Jesus when a human being being was glorified immortal in a physical body now there's a man as the image and likeness of god right and that's what god's after all people so the problem for man wasn't that their nature was evil because nature speaks of genesis our genesis is from god that's not our problem our problem is that sin the wisdom of the serpent found a way to enter the earth and found an opportunity to manifest death in our physical bodies so the gospel isn't about evil people becoming good it's about dead people being made alive Amen. okay and so god had to do something to save us from death now, something magical happens in the heart of a human when they become persuaded that their life, the life they have, overcomes death. What it does in their soul is it restores their soul and it removes a laboring mentality. It removes this mindset, which is evil, of laboring and toiling to try to have life. And if you look in the Hebrew and the Greek, the word evil means to be filled with labor and toil. That's what evil means. It doesn't mean to be like Count Dracula. It doesn't mean that your genesis is bad. It doesn't mean your DNA is corrupt. That's not what it means. What it means is, is you've adopted a persuasion or a belief by which you're going to have life by your own ability. That's an evil mindset. Now, when sin entered the world, we saw death manifesting in our bodies and it compelled us to think we had to labor for life, labor for life, labor for life. That's why Jeremiah said the heart of man is abundantly wicked. He's saying the heart of man is filled with laboring and toiling to have life. That's when he goes into cursed is the man that makes flesh his arm. Blessed is the man whose hope is in the Lord and who trusts in the arm of God, right? And so that's, the, that's what had to be ironed out. Now, when our hearts become persuaded that we have life in Jesus, which is the testimony God gave in Jesus, I'm going to give you life. I'm going to promise you life as a gift through my son. When you believe on that and that spirit dwells in you and it starts telling your heart, my life overcomes this world. My life overcomes death. It cleanses your conscience from laboring and toiling to try to have life. And it brings about something in you where you rest in God to give you life as a gift. Right? And that's how really the whole gospel, if you want to look at it shortly, that's, that's what it's really about. And that's where Calvinism would miss it. Jesus is the lamb that took away the sin of the whole world. Not some, the whole world. There's no such a thing as a limited atonement. Jesus is the high priest of the entire human race. If you go and study what a high priest is, it's somebody representing a whole people. Not just the ones that will believe or not. It is a representative of a whole people. So Jesus comes as the high priest of all people. And he represents all people. And his death unto sin was the death of all people unto sin. Right? And what that did was it removed the cherubim swords that blocked the tree of life in Genesis. It moved them out of the way. And now all people have free access to the tree of life if they want it. Right? Not some people. All people. I mean, what did Paul say this way? Paul said, what, what, if, what if some didn't believe? 
Does that make the faithfulness of God of no effect? Certainly not. So the idea that because some wouldn't believe that makes Jesus' atonement limited would be to say that God's faithfulness is somehow impacted negatively by whether people believe or not. Whether people believe or not does not change the faithfulness of God to all humanity. Right? In the beginning, God took it upon himself to provide for man. He's now not going to turn back on the passion in his heart towards people based on whether they believe or not. So he comes and does a work for all people. And now his spirit is in the earth trying to influence people to believe. What he's done? To give them life as a gift. We need life. We were created for life. We saw we didn't have life. And so we're roaming around trying to get it. God came down and said, listen, guys, I'm going to get what you need, and then I'm going to give it to you as a gift. That way you see you can stop trying to get it. Now your conscience won't be filled with trying to get it, but your conscience will be filled with, Abba has given me life for free. (laughs) Right? And so God came down and got the life we were running around like chickens with our head chopped off trying to get Running around like maniacs, trying to get it. God's like watching us swim back and forth across the Atlantic, coming back without the prize still, tag teaming somebody. He comes, he swims across, he gets the prize, he comes back, he's standing on the beach and he's like, here man, here's the life that you've always dreamt of. I'm going to give it to you as a gift. And then we're like, oh, I, he who has the son? What did John say? He who has the Son has what? Life. Now that has far-reaching ramifications in the heart of a human when it's actually preached the right way. Right? It will set them free from a heart, an evil heart or a heart filled with labor and toil. An evil heart doesn't mean my physical heart is from the devil and I'm a devil. An evil heart is a heart that's been corrupted with laboring and toiling to try to have life. That's all it means. It's not some like hocus pocus kind of thing where these people are good and these people are bad. You could just as well say a poisoned heart. Yeah. So the, the, the expression refers to the poison, not to the heart. It's the poison that's the problem, not the heart. Yes. Glory to God. Glory to God. I felt like uh, a while there, years ago, that I had to justify why I felt what I believed what I believed. That um, I, I'm gonna have faith does me. I don't do faith. I felt I had to justify that to people, and that comes from way back when, you know. Um, prove yourself, you know. So memorize a thousand scriptures, and when I realized it was stealing my peace, and I was trying to be the savior <laughs> instead of just letting my spirit. I met that person. That spirit can do the work of itself. And I imagine Paul, when he went to Rome, he didn't attack. He said, look at all the statues, the thousands of statues that you're, you're worshiping. Wow, that's really something you guys are really seeking God. Then he went on to explain to him. He didn't attack them. So, yeah, we don't have to justify ourselves. He's already justified us <laughs> and our friends. Yeah, and the burden of persuasion. I love yes. what Thomas said. I don't know how long he said it now because the years seem to click over. seems like it was just yesterday, but it was probably like four years ago. He said the burden, he came up one day after the message and said, the burden of persuasion isn't on me. God's taken it upon himself to persuade me. And now I just listen to the words he uses to persuade. And then it's on him. It's not on me. And that's how it is. God's taken it upon himself to persuade people. Right? It's not on us. And I, I love what Paul said there. And Paul was very friendly to these pagan people. He wasn't rude to them. He come and said, inasmuch as we all live and move and have our being in God. Seeing how we all live and move and have our being in God, let me tell you about this God so you could see the spirit by which this God lives. And then you could find yourself walking after that same spirit. And I even think he goes into how God isn't worshipped by man's hands. I think if you go back, if memory serves me right, if you read Acts 17, when he's talking, he talks about this God whom they're worshipping. And he says, you can't worship this God by the works of your hands. You can't worship this God by what you're going to do for him. That's not how you worship this God. The way you worship this God is by believing on what he said in Jesus. You know what he's come and said to us in Jesus? You guys 
are my beloved children. My face shines in adoration when I look at you guys. So much so that even when you were dead in your sin, even when you were naked in your blood, I got down on one knee in adoration and spoke well of you. Now, listen, because I love you, because I don't want your life to perish with this world, but I want to preserve it eternally, I've conquered your death in Jesus. And I've done something to where you can have eternal life as a gift in Jesus. And he comes to grab us by the hand and walk with us, right? I mean, that's it. That's the testimony he's given in Jesus, is that he doesn't want us to perish. His face shines in adoration of us. All this stuff is in the Bible. Can you imagine that? And because his face shines in adoration of us, he saw the sin and death that was killing us. So he came as our David to conquer our sin and our death and to give us eternal life as a gift. And so all we do is believe the work that he's done. That's it. Something happens by the Spirit when a person, uh, like the guy you've been communicating with, when they, and I've I've said this in so many words to a friend of mine, I'm for you, I'm just against what you believe. (laughs) You see the, the two elements there? And that's exactly how God sees us. He's for us, but he's against what we believe. If what we believe is we can have life apart from him. That's right. That's right. I mean, it's really, and that's what humbling ourselves would be. It would just be to say, yeah, daddy, I can't give myself life. I see you want to give it to me for free. I'll take it. Right? It's like on Christmas when my parents wanted to give me gifts. How did I, how did I humble myself? I just took them. I took the gifts they wanted to give me. I mean, we think of humble ourselves as like it's this horrible thing. The guy wants to come and give you his kingdom and his life as a gift. He wants to seat you at his right hand. He doesn't want to make you lesser. He wants to make you equal with him. This is the creator of the whole universe. And humbling yourself would just be to say, yeah, this guy's going to give it to me as a gift. I don't have to work for it. That's humbling yourself. And I'll tell you, when you, uh, when you think about just about most forms of Christianity that you see, when you go like to church and stuff, there is this unseen tenseness that exists. That although the outward appearances might look good, there's this there's this tenseness that exists there and in relationships and stuff like that. Because it's presented to you that you're always trying to attain something. Right. You always, it's always right out there for you to have, but you're always trying to attain. But when you give up the ghost on that and come to realize that he's already provided you everything you need for life and godliness, the tenseness kind of goes away and you can relax and live your life. That's, that's good, Maurice. Yep. Every, every time going to church is like an employee review meeting. <laughs> you know, you know, I mean, how are you measuring up? You know? uh, and listen, that, that's the message the serpent spearheaded. Yeah. In the beginning, God did everything that was needed for Adam and Eve to have life and godliness. And he came and gave it to them as a gift. Well, the serpent come and said, you don't have everything that need, that's needed pertaining to life and godliness. You lack something. But... If you use your ability, you can get what you lack, right? And so that's the whole message. And so the way God quenches the serpent's message is he comes and fills our souls full of abundance. He comes and preaches a word to us in Jesus that says how he's once again shaken the heavens and the earth and given us all things that pertain to life and godliness as a gift so that we could see. That we have all things that pertain to life and godliness. And every time we heard some voice telling us how we lacked something, we would know it was the voice of the stranger and not the voice of the father. Right? (laughs) And then our souls are saved from being subverted. And my sheep hear my voice. So the people who are, whose hearts are prepared for that, they say, oh yeah, you know what? That's the truth. And that you know it almost immediately. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. So on, that, on that verse that says, um, <clears throat> um, and now my mind is blank. So, you know, if you have the Son, you have life. Yeah. So that really is the mindset of the Son. If 
you believe like my son believed that I'm his father, yes. then you have life. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, that's the spirit of what the scriptures are communicating. Right? The, the spirit and the letter of the scriptures. Paul talked about in the new covenant, we're not ministers of the letter. We're ministers of the spirit. And so he says the word we're speaking to people is the spirit, not the letter. And then he comes and says, oh, and by the way, the Lord Jesus is the spirit that I'm talking about. And then he goes in to talk about how God who called forth light out of the darkness through the spirit of faith. He says, we having the same spirit. And so as ministers of the, the gospel or like what, what you said, as, as ministers of, of Jesus as the word, we come and we declare that God has gotten down on bended knee in adoration of them. And that he loves their life so much that he wants to preserve it eternally in them. And how by one man, Adam, death entered the world. So we need to be saved from that death. And this guy loves us so much. We're so beautiful to him. Our lives are so precious that he wants to save us from that death. Right? He wants to save us from the sin that comes into the world telling us we can have life by our works. And then as we preach that, people begin to see God as Abba. The same way Jesus saw God as Abba. They begin to see the work God will do or has done to give them life. They begin to see the reason he'll do this is because he loves them. They'll begin to see they're not bereft of a father. They're not orphans in the earth. But they have a good father whose good pleasure is to do everything for them. And then they'll find something in them where they've been called out of the darkness. And they'll be in the glorious light of the sun. Because they'll find themselves thinking about God and their life with God the same way Jesus did. And Jesus thought of God as father. He didn't think of God as taskmaster. He didn't think of God as the thief that steals and kills and leaves people beaten and bloodied on the road. He saw God as the good Samaritan. That when he finds people beaten and bloodied on the road, he comes and picks them up and fills them with oil and wine and brings them into his house and feeds and clothes them. That's how Jesus saw God. Jesus saw he didn't have to justify himself because he saw the Father would justify him. He saw he didn't have to give himself life because he said the Father will give me life as a gift. His heart cried out, Abba. He had a song in his heart that was Abba will not forsake me. Abba will not leave me in the grave. Abba will not leave me naked. Abba will prove I'm the son. Abba will clothe me with light and life. And as we preach the spirit of the scriptures, which, was made, which is what was made flesh in Jesus, we calling forth people out of the darkness into the glorious light of the sun because they find themselves connecting with God from the same foundation Jesus did. Abba. If I'm engaging with somebody and we're fighting, so many fights and so much strife come from both people trying to justify themselves. But when the spirit of the son is born in me, because people have preached the spirit of the scriptures to me, in a fight, I'm no longer trying to justify myself because I see Abba will justify me. See, that sets me free to engage in a different way in the argument where I'm not fighting to prove my value and worth. I'm not fighting to prove who's right and who's wrong. I'm not fighting to justify myself, but I'm able to engage from a platform of love because I'm resting in the Father's love for me. He loves me so much, he's gonna prove I'm the son. He's gonna prove I'm a daughter. I don't have to prove it in this fight. I don't have to prove anything. And then what happens is, is you find yourself resting in the Father's love and you find that love come out of you towards people. Do you see how that dynamic works? Guys, so, much, so many of our fights and disagreements are born from both of us trying to be justified in the fight. Who's right and who's wrong? And if we're being honest, we think we're going to gain something by being right. And we think we're going to lose something by being wrong. It's as if we think something can be taken away from our stature if we're wrong. And that something can be added to it. Like there's a bunch of Legos or something. And we're all adding to our pieces. Especially like in marriage relationships, right? We both have our piles. And it's like, who can add the next piece? <laughs> so whose pile can be bigger? <laughs> That's more like Jenga. <laughs> Jenga, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I was, uh, I was asked to uh, uh, speak several times, but I was asked to speak uh, this one time. Um, I was doing uh, Athletes in Action, and they asked me to speak at uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And I chose Isaiah 61. Um, I chose it on purpose because at that particular time, I think one of the catchphrases was, you can be born again. Um, so 
so in Isaiah 61 it says, I have I'm come, this is the first time he spoke, I've come to rescue you. That was my key word. I said he came to rescue us. He saved us, but he came to rescue us from what? Because we are his kids and he loves us. And he came to rescue us from death and religion. Long story short, there was about eight men that, I mean, came, tell me more, tell me more. Now, the rest, there was gnashing of teeth. I was asked to speak next week to come and repent of what I said. Oh, oh yeah. And it was, I, I, I thought it was such great news. <laughs> and, I, and, and it was, it was, you know, it was my, it was my, um, uh, it was an eye opener that it could be. I, I, I now I said, man, now I see what the disciples went through. Holy moly, with all the law, you know. And it was an eye opener to see how angry. I mean, I lived there. I did the law. I tried to, you know, like you said, I, you know, worked it to the bone, you know. I memorized my, my kids memorizing. They had to me you had to memorize ten scriptures a week. I mean, that was it. Or you didn't get to ride your bike or anything else. You know, everything was taken away. So um, <clears throat> that was such an eye opener. And, 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 and <laughs> you once said in one of your one of your uh, messages, you know what? I, I just realized I'm not for everybody. Some people are not going to like me. You know? And so that's kind of how I felt. You know, these people, and I, I didn't go back there and repent. I talked to the people and said, no, I'm not doing that. This is, you know, what I believe in. And they were, I mean, I pound the table, get up and leave. You call yourself a Christian type thing. So, yeah, it's, it's very powerful. Very powerful. And it's, you know, and I can, if I saw somebody who was happy and free when I was in the law, I resented them. I, uh, I envied them. I think I resented myself. But I, would, but I envied them. You're, that, no, you can't be that happy. No, no, no. You're supposed to be, you're supposed to be agonizing and, and grinding out the gospel. There's a godly sorrow, <laughs> brother. Knock on doors. You know, you're supposed to be doing all kinds of stuff. Yeah, you know, so. it, it, and it, it is. It can be shocking because the, the, when you really hear the good news, it's so good that you just assume everybody's going to like it. But oh, listen, yeah. Jesus came and they didn't like it. They didn't like what he said. He's God. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he, he, he wasn't coming like with some new set of rules and, and, and mark mortar making for those guys. Notice what he said. He said, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. His yoke there is a doctrine. The Jewish guys, they, when they talked about yoke, it was like a rabbi. You would say you've taken on the yoke of Rabbi Rashi, or you've taken on the yoke of Rabbi Tobias. And so when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, he was saying, take the teaching that I'm giving upon you, for it will bring forth rest in your souls. And they, they, they crucified him. They didn't want to kill him. They did. But notice Jesus said that he didn't come to make peace. He came to bring a sword. You see, and what happens is, is when you preach the good news, it's not ambivalent. People aren't going to be like, oh, well, I who cares? Tut, 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 tut. No, no, no. It's going to draw a reaction. It's going to draw rejoicing or anger, right, is what it's going to do. If you've actually preached the good news and you got a group of people where you have some religious and some that have already realized their religion can't save them, you'll have those that are very happy and then you'll have those that are very angry. And you'll get that response every time. Right? And it, sure. it is a little off-putting, though, because you don't really expect it. You just think people will be happy. Well, look, you, just, you had just said yourself, I, I don't mind I'm working hard, but I don't want to work hard for nothing. Yeah. And that's what that is. Yeah. You're chasing a ghost. Yeah. One of the things with Calvinism is they, they use this acronym TULIP, T-U-L-I-P, and the I stands for irresistible grace. So they think they've got the market cornered on grace. It's like we define grace. And they always use the term sovereign grace. That means God can do what he wants to do. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but they've got that buried and tattooed in their brain. And uh, it's hard to talk to them about the kind of grace that we talk about. That's love, you know. 
I was asked not to come back to Romania by the Baptist leadership there. <laughs> I've been there five times. The last time I went, they said, don't come back. Thanks a lot. Oh, man. Why? Why not? Because you're preaching to people that God wants to heal people. Not just physical healing, but that he wants to heal them. You know the opposite is true, though, now? When I hear a law message, it makes me angry. Does it? I don't want to hear it. You know? <laughs> I don't even want to hear it, you know. And that's all you can see on, on Facebook. Yeah. The, and and I, that could be one of the places where you find yourself. And it's as you sit with, with God and sit with people. I realized my anger wasn't with the people preaching it. I realized my passion was against the message that I know hurts people. And so that's what would happen. And even sometimes I don't get this right all the time. People try to engage me nonstop and talk about nonstop doctrines. And I used to engage all the time and spend countless hours with them. But it never looked like it really produced anything the first few times I did it. I mean, I spent like three months with people just debating their doctrines with them. At, at the end of the three months, them still wanting to argue about it. And so I, I gave it up thinking none of it was any good, and I got frustrated. But what, what happened is, out of me being exposed to all their doctrines and all their thoughts, man, I got so much revelation from God that it was obscene. And it was like this beautiful thing was happening inside of me, even when outwardly I deemed it to be negative. To the degree now that even when I get caught up in, in being exposed to that kind of a thing, or engaging with somebody from a doctrine I completely disagree with, I know God is going to bring massive revelation to me that is going to be like a light unto people's feet that's going to lead them out of the destruction. And so it's like, it's kind of turned my frustration into joy or my sorrow into joy, right? It's like the way I process it now is that, man, the life of God will swallow and overcome this and will lead the people out. Hallelujah. And the more I can see it, the more I can be... I can be strengthened in the truth and I can find myself with words to speak to people that are in this place, right? I mean, you started off by saying you have a desire to be able to communicate with people. I don't know if that's how you heard it, but that's what you were really saying, but I don't know how. And so what I see going on with you is you and God are having a let us moment, which is let us talk with these people. And now you're kind of like, how do you talk with these people, right? Which is the, the right uh, way for a son to think. Because that's casting it back into God's hands. But I would just encourage you that this frustration you feel, it's actually you just desire to be able to communicate with them and bring them out of the error. And I would just say God's building it in you. And I would say you and God are actively talking about it. And so when you feel frustrated, let this be in the back of your head. And just realize your frustration is you desire for them to be let out. But then recognize God's doing something in you and in lots of other people to bring them out. And so Isaiah is going to come to pass. God's word is not going to return to him void. It doesn't matter how many people look confused, right? God is bringing about what his word was sent to do. And, and so let that kind of be in you. And I, that's really kind of what prayer is. And that's what I see you and God doing. You're kind of praying. And you don't even recognize it because of our, our warped view of prayer. But prayer is kind of like let us where we come together with God in one heart and our hearts connect and we, we just kind of have this let us thing, right? And that's what I would, I would say to you is that I think you and God are bringing something about where you will be able to talk to these people. If you feel frustrated, I would tell you it's okay. God's going to bring forth words in you. He's going to bring forth eyes in you. He's going to bring forth revelation in you that's going to be able to discern their hearts and how to connect. And you just kind of feel, it's almost like a woman that's laboring in travail. She can feel kind of like the pangs of childbirth up until she gives birth. That might not feel real nice. It might feel stressful. It could feel frustrating. But then when the baby comes forth, it's like, oh, what great joy. It's almost like that. I see the, this frustration. That it's almost like a laboring, but God is bringing forth a beautiful thing. And, and so, man, there'll be great joy when you see it. We, we kind of hate adversity, you know, but I think the Lord takes adversity and he speaks to us in the adversity, mm -hmm. you know, and even though there's a little bit of turmoil and wrestling back and forth that goes on there, he's giving you insight into these people. Yeah. 
You know, he's, he's helping you to see it from their perspective, not to be against them, but to just understand them and to, so that you can relate to them. Yeah. You know? That's one thing that I don't want my uh, frustration to be the father of why I'm engaging with them yeah, yeah. and trying to, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I noticed that a long time ago, man, when I was really getting into the Word, I was locked up and I was engaging with these Muslims. And, they're, and it made, because I didn't know how to, you know, I didn't know how to come back to what they were saying to me. And that made me really study the Word. You know what I mean? But yeah. then I look back at it, I'm like, the only reason I was really studying it is so I could come back at them. It wasn't like really mm -hmm. doing it to, to know God, you know what I mean? I wouldn't judge it that way. I would say you don't even really know why you were going yeah. to the I would say you and God were having a let us moment. I think too much about things. Yeah. I mean, so many times I look back now and realize God was like, let us. And I didn't even realize what he was doing. We see ourselves so far removed from the Godhead, we think that we don't have those conversations with God. We think God has those conversations separate from us. And then we're down here, and he comes and gives us an order, like he's the general and we're the foot soldier. No, no, no. There's a reason there's a human seated in the Godhead. A man is seated in the Godhead. So humans have been joined together in the Godhead. We're part of let us. And the way God brings forth desires in our hearts is he comes to us with a desire that he sees that he has for us and that he thinks we could enjoy. And then he comes alive inside of us and says, let us. Right. It talks about God giving us the desires of our heart. Right. He comes with, with this desire. Let us. And we, we don't hear it that way all the time. But that's what's going on when we feel passionate about something. And then we're like, yeah, let us. Let us, Daddy. I mean, my greatest example, and that's really prayer. That's, that's praying with God about his heart and your heart, and you're engaging with him. And my best story about that is when I was like four or five years old in this charismatic Bible study, all these people were giving words, and I was like five years old in this late night meeting because the Catholic priest wasn't supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you know? And so it was bad for him to be having these Holy Spirit meetings. So we had to do it Wednesday night late when no one knew. And, and I'm sitting there like a five-year-old trying to find scriptures. And I remember telling God, just give me something I could say to these people that will set them free. And I just blew that off. Like it was nothing. I didn't even really remember it. And then like six years ago, I'm standing in the mirror at my parents' house. We'd already started the church. And I'm shaving my head, you know, because they have the two-sided mirror. And all of a sudden, I hear the voice of God plain as day. One of the only times I heard it audibly. that he said, so you think I showed you something? <laughs> and I was like... And it like, I hadn't thought about that moment in years. And it's like he discerned that moment for me and like revealed that that was him there saying, let us, let us share something with these people. And I was like, my heart, I was innocent. I was a child. So I was like, yeah, let us, you know, and now he comes back and discerned. But I think God has had that conversation with all of us in different areas, like a let us. Right. And we don't realize exactly what's going on because we, we haven't been taught about union as much as as what it really is. Right. But I, I think what Maurice brought up is good is we don't like adversity so much. Does anybody have anything they want to say about that? We sure don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I like to avoid conflict at all. <laughs> adversity doesn't feel nice, huh? Everybody agree with that? But we have that too. Well, better yeah. and in some ways okay you know you eat right or dress cleaner or something but but for God to think that God's going to favor them more if they clean up their act it, it is frustrating to try to help them see what they're doing without being abrasive <laughs> I'm pretty blunt, so it's hard to say anything without being real blunt. Yeah. You know, and, it, and you just want to go, listen. <laughs> but, but they don't. 
you know, but they will because God is persuading them. We just have to believe that God's persuading their hearts. Yeah. Just to see us sitting there faithfully every week. You know. That's the part, right? Resting. It's like if you make a big meal and you're happy with the meal. You want people to enjoy the meal, and if no one comes and enjoys the meal, you can feel frustrated. Yeah. That's the difficult part with sharing the gospel, yeah. is that many times we're also, not only do we not like adversity, we also like instant gratification. Absolutely. Right? And so if we are excited about something, the message or a word, we want to give it, and it's like we want to see a person come out of the grave immediately. And if we don't, then we judge the whole deal to be evil. And what we don't realize is a human being is not like a machine that you come and lube up or, you know, with a wrench. Oh, perfect. The, the, the heart of a human is a very complex thing. And many times there's many layers in a person's heart that have got to be dealt with. They could have many walls built up of pain and trauma. They've got a whole life of the world coming against them. And so many times we don't know what, what has to be done in their hearts. And so if we don't see instant gratification, it's like we feel failure. Right. Or we, we got it wrong or there was a different way to get it instead of just realizing that it's a seed sown. Right. And then when we feel that frustration, talk with God. He'll lift it off of us. That right. Seed is gonna produce. That seed is going to produce. And, and it's not up to us. No. And a, a part of the, the, the fruit of the spirit is patience. Right. And so if we feel frustrated, that's an OK thing. We could talk <laughs> with God and we'll find him. He'll cleanse our conscience from it. Right. And so I would just encourage anybody that shares, don't judge yourself as good or evil by the result. Don't judge the other people as good or evil by the result. Don't judge the word as good or evil by the result that you see right in front of your face. Commit it into God's hands, right? After you give a word, commit it into God's hands. I do that a lot of times after I preach. When I, I'll just sit and pray with God, and I'll just commit it into his hands. Because the only reason why you preach is for people to have life. And so sometimes before you know it, you're judging yourself by whether or not you think you see enough people having life, right? And then before you know it, man, you're frustrated and you're judging yourself as evil. You're drug judging the word as evil. And, and, and then, man, you could even find yourself judging the people as what's wrong with them. They just don't want it. <laughs> How many of you ever had that where you find yourself in that? They just don't want the truth. <laughs> That's us trying to bring peace to our own souls when we don't like what we see. Right? You notice how we judge the hearts of other people. We don't even realize it. And what God will do is he'll free us up from all that, where we don't judge ourselves, we don't judge the word, and we don't judge them. We're free to just let it rip and then walk away and let the word do what he do. Because the gospel ain't about people having a relationship with God through us. The gospel is about a person having a relationship between them and God. And so it's for them to go off, and they're going to go off and talk with God. And you don't know what them and God are doing behind closed doors. You don't know what needs to be overcome. Let us just have joy in the fact that there is a nice word to preach, right? And just be happy with that. Let's just be happy about how good the word is to preach and not be judging the effects. And listen, I, when I say these things, I understand only God can do it, so I'm not telling us to work it up. I'm speaking the truth so we can hear it, be confronted with it, and it can do something to us. And I'm also speaking to myself because, listen, a few years ago when I spent three, three years trying to explain to a guy that why Jesus had to die on the cross, and after it, he was still in the same place, I felt very frustrated, right? And so I'm speaking to myself. But at the end of it all, I see that something beautiful came out of all of that. And we need to recognize, um, I don't want to say we need to recognize, but let us recognize that adversity can't conquer us. Right? Marie said none of us like adversity. When we encounter adversity, we think it's a sign that we're off the road. Or that something isn't as it ought to be. Or this isn't right. And so then it, it, it compounds the effect of it. But we want to be persuaded from God that, man, the life we have, even though it's in a, a mortal vessel still, it's imperishable. And it isn't conquered by adversity. But the life we have from God conquers adversity. So when we encounter adversity, let us see that we possess a life that will take adversity and make a diamond out of it. And let our minds start to be filled with the diamond that will come out of the adversity instead of, look at this adversity, it's going to swallow us. 
Do do you see what I'm saying? Because we tend to look at adversity that way. As if it can conquer us. But it can't. Adversity cannot conquer you. I said adversity can't conquer you. There's no greater adversity in all of the universe than what came against Jesus as a human being. And he came out. And so that, that's a sign to all of us, guys, when we encounter adversity. Let our minds be filled with the truth that we possess a life that will swallow up the adversity and that it will bring forth something beautiful from it. And so we could find ourselves thinking about adversity like that. I'd like to offer an illustration that's kind of humorous and not to, mm. under, not, not to uh, understate what you're saying, but we, we got a vacation coming up. First time we've gone on a family vacation in four years. And the last time we went was the first time we ever went on a really nice vacation. We went on a cruise. But my family, you got to multiply everything by eight, okay, because we got six kids. And anyway, we got this vacation. The last one was like the best vacation of my entire life. This one coming up, we have high hopes. Two of my daughters got in a fight with each other. And the younger daughter says to me, Dad, I've got this deep, burning hatred in my heart towards her. <laughs> I mean, like, there goes the vacation. <laughs> okay, because we got three girls in one cabin, and two of them are fit. And Lisa was getting bent out of shape over it, and I was like, there's nothing you can do. Don't try to fix it. If you try to fix it, okay. Just, you know, we had a backup plan. It's like, one of you is not coming. <laughs> okay, we, we already started putting our backup plan. But talk about adversity, again, just you know, kind of a humorous example. It's like, you know what? We're powerless to fix this. It's just gonna have to work itself out. And like within two weeks, they've kissed and made up and we're at a party and one's sitting on the other's lap, okay? We could have spent a lot of time and energy trying to manipulate the situation or creating, uh, creating uh, ultimatums or conditions and. And not that our minds didn't go there, but uh, it effortlessly, from our perspective, worked its, its way out. And even if it didn't work its way out, that wasn't going to define whether we could enjoy ourselves or not. Yeah. That's it. That's you know, it. I, I uh, used to go, this, this is years ago, to a lumber yard and had very little react, interaction with this one young man. He loaded my trucks with lumber and but and we had a few conversations. I've, I've been using this lumber yard for five years or so, <clears throat> and uh, I think after about two or three years, I noticed he was gone. Like I think, and I, I'm not even sure I know his name. I thought it was Tom. <clears throat> Maybe about eight years later, he looked me up. He saw me, and he said, "I just want to tell you this." I, uh, I said, "What are you doing now?" He goes, "I'm a pastor." You're a pastor. Really? He says, you know, um, you had a pivotal point in me making that decision. I never once even said the word of Jesus to him. I never shared with him, ever. And he remembered that. But he said, you just had something. And I asked the guys, and one of the guys said, oh yeah, he, he, one guy said he's a church goer, one guy said he's a Christian, one, you know, they knew me, but he didn't. So, the thing about um, Walt saying this little light, all of us have that light. We didn't have nothing to do with it, you know? <laughs> he just, <laughs> when we walk in a room, he walks in with us. Let us walk in this room. Let us be a part of this. And, let us be, and I, I, I'm really guilty of, of thinking, well, this is how it should go. This is how it should play out, you know? And. I, it's, I've been so wrong so many times. Now I know, <clears throat> how are you gonna play this out? I'm gonna sit back and be part of watching it. And be the audience instead of trying to be the, 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 the director, you know? And it's much easier being the audience and watching him than you trying to direct and get frustrated. Amen. Well, you say sometimes adversity makes you understand the other person better. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it makes you understand yourself. Oh yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Sure. Experiencing that in a special way. In a special way. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, were you? Yeah, the other night at the prison, um, we were uh, sharing the word and speaking life, and we were getting the deer in the headlight look. And then this inmate spoke 
the same thing we were speaking in inmate ease, and they applauded it. <laughs> That's good. You needed a translator. You were just speaking. Yeah, exactly. translator. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like when you know when you squeeze you squeeze a turnip, you you don't get blood out of a turnip, right? Because there's not blood in a turnip. You know, it's like us, man. The life of God is in us. You know what happens when you squeeze God's life? It oozes out. It oozes out. And so it's like we, we, we get convinced that we're, when we're in the pressure cooker getting squeezed that somehow life isn't going to come out or that life isn't going to swallow or envelop the situation. But when you squeeze something, what's in it is what's going to come out. And what's in us is life. And not just any old kind of a life. The life of God is in us. And when you squeeze it, you see what comes out of it, right? And th that's beautiful what you said about being the, the spectator instead of thinking you're the director or the maestro. Because it is. It's much nicer to watch a show that someone else has put on than trying to organize the show yourself. Right? And dealing with all the little intricacies of getting everything to go off the right way and making sure all the people who come to the show are happy and all that kind of a thing. You know, like ladies, when you're doing Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner and you got all the people coming over and you're busy trying to plan all the details and cook all the food and you're thinking about all the... Man, that can stress you out. And then some years, somebody else is doing it. And you can just go and be a spectator. That's kind of nice sometimes, isn't it? That's a great point, yeah. Billy. It's like, what did Paul say? We're more than conquerors yeah. in Christ, right? We're more yeah. than conquerors in, in Christ. And w what he's talking about that we would conquer is that anything in this world that could come against us. He didn't say that we can conquer. He said we're more than conquerors. Do you, do you see the language play there? He, what he's doing is... Dwarfing the eye, dwarfing, he's trying to shrink anything that could come against us. And he's actually putting it in its proper light, which is anything that could come against us is actually nothing in comparison to the glory and the life we have in God, right? So we're more than conquerors over anything that this world could ever throw at us. So even if we feel adversity, even if we find our minds being come against with thoughts, man, let us sit and talk with God about the life we have from him in Christ and what that life looks like and what that life did at the cross and in the resurrection and what that life did when it was squeezed and what that life did when it encountered adversity. And then let us realize that's what that life will do in us. We don't do the life. The life will do us. Right. It's just being aware of it. Right. And so we can we can either walk through the adversity miserable and stressed out. And we could still come out on top, or we could walk through the adversity the whole time knowing we're going to come out on top. <laughs> do, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> what? My daughter always calls that laughing and faithful. Yeah. Yeah. Glory to God. Lisa and I did some prison ministry years ago. And uh, I was a little apprehensive about going behind bars and being by these guys. Lisa was no big deal. Anyway, uh, they had this little uh, program, and these guys were getting like little certificates for completing the program, and we were, I guess, the honored guest where we'd hand out the. This one guy came. He was a uh, picture of NFL football player. I mean, that's how tall, big the guy was over me. And when I shook his hand, I could tell there was something there, or something up with him. So I left the line and took him in the little hallway. This is just he and I. And uh, he told me that like two months ago, he had switched the television program on the, on the TV. And this other inmate, who I remember he said was in a wheelchair, didn't want him to change the channel. So he pulled out a shiv and stabbed him several times, almost killed him. This big old guy. And he said, that this guy told me, he said, I was on the table where they were operating on him. He said, I just didn't want to die. I didn't want to die. And I remember looking up at this guy and I said, not only did God not want you to die, God wants you to live. I'll never forget that. How you can say something as simple as that. Nobody wants to die, but do they know God wants them to live? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that God wants them to live. I mean, God loves our lives more than we do. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a, 
That's a hard thought to come to terms with. But he loves our life more than we do. Our lives are more precious to, to him than they are even to us. So that man broke down crying right in the hallway and received Christ. Wow. His hands were like, I remember he was holding my hand. I'm like, this guy could like break me in two if he wanted to. I wasn't afraid, but I just remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was like this big old guy. Yeah. <laughs> I was in the prison ministry, yeah. Uh, thing one time we went in the hospital and there's a guy with his foot in the bucket and uh, this guy you know, I'd, I'd been there talking to him but we had this other, this other guy who had been in prison uh, called the bandana bandit he was going around from Texas and doing some stuff but anyway so the guy I'm talking to said well I'm here because I shot three cops <laughs> you know he said, I got like triple life sentence but it's something we was out in the field and his boot got messed up and his foot was you know, soaking in betadine. So, this, this, this bandit, a bandit guy walks in. He's a little bitty guy, you know? But he was, he was tough. He could handle himself, you know? And, uh, and he said, what's your problem? You know, he says, I got rot in my foot. He says, you ain't got just rot in your foot, man. If you don't get straight, you know, with Jesus. <laughs> your, your whole life's going to be a rot, you know? I mean, I'm like, hey, this guy just shot three cops, you know. <laughs> I'm going to be in the middle of this, you know. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't take well to authority figures. Right. <laughs> right. But it's, 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 uh, it is rewarding, you know, to be able to go. We, we, they let us, I was in Angola and, and St. Gabriel, all the women's prison and everything, but they, will, they let us go everywhere except death row. We couldn't go to death row. That's, for some, some reason. Some of the people are really rough, you know, you know, shake camp and all that. But God's good. Amen. Amen. That's the whole thing, the goodness of God. The goodness. It's the goodness of, what did Paul say? It's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. Yes. And how does that work? What that means is, is you see that God is so good to you that he comes and gives you life for free. And then that causes you to change your mind from thinking you have to give yourself life, right? That, that's how it works. You repent from looking to your own works to be justified, and you believe on the work God did to justify you. That's, that's how repentance works. And you can see it with Adam. Adam was trying to clothe himself, right? And then the goodness of God came, and God clothed Adam. You notice that? And so Adam's busy trying to clothe himself and then still seeing himself as naked. And then God comes and clothes Adam. And so Adam could see in that moment, well, I was busy trying to clothe myself. I never was actually clothed. And now God, even while I was naked and in my blood, he came and clothed me. I see that even when I was dead in my sin, this guy's heart raced after me so much so that he come and clothed me. I don't have to clothe myself. And that's how the goodness of God would lead to re repentance, right? Yeah, repent, repent is another one of those hijacked terms. Yeah. I used to think uh, when I was down in Bourbon Street partying, I'd hear people with a blow horn saying, repent, turn to Jesus. I would think, well, they're just trying to take, oh, my, take my fun away. Yeah, right. That's oh, all they're party. trying to do. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not having fun. I'm not going to do that. But... Uh, Another way to put it is, it's, it's not me changing my mind, it's my mind being changed. Yeah. Actually, Paul called it a repentance unto life. Yeah. Now that is right. difference from repentance from sin. Right. Yep. Repentance right. So unto the life. persuasion, the persuasion uh, by God through the Holy Spirit in a man's heart uh, results in something we call belief or faith. And it informs our mind that what we thought before is not true this is true that's repentance yes now repentance is taught uh, all too often and even if it's not taught this way i think it's heard this way that you have to change your behavior you have to change your conduct uh, you do these things these things are sin you got to stop doing those you be willing you to stop in fact there's a group of people who uh, would evangelize in romania and they were called the repenters <laughs> That's what they were known as, the Romanians, because they'd come and tell the people, you're doing this, you got to stop drinking, you got to stop smoking, you got to start going to church, you need to repent. Yeah. So those people call it repenters. Listen, man, nowhere does the scripture say that it was the smoking of cigarettes that condemned someone to eternal death. 
right? Or even the drinking of wine or something, right? That doesn't mean that we're going to go be a drunkard and sit in the street all day and drink. But those things are not the problem. Those things isn't what killed Adam, right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil didn't have cigarettes and beer hanging on it. That's not what Adam partook of that brought death in his body. It was a way of thinking. And so it's like a total misunderstanding of scriptures when we live that way. I love what you said about repentance is something that will happen to you. God will come and change your mind. Right? He'll show himself some, he'll show something to you about himself and his thoughts and intentions towards you that will change your mind about life. And you'll have like, if we want to use this language, a different world view or a different philosophical view. And that's what will happen. Now listen, if you're no longer enlisting your members to give yourself peace and love and joy, then your flesh is resting. And so then the works of the flesh don't have an opportunity to manifest. But that's not the thing that you repent from, right? You're not trying to repent from the works of the flesh. There is a certain belief that's taken your body captive that's bringing forth its fruit in you. And so what God comes to do is he looks on the thing in your heart. And he comes to change the belief in your heart. And that's what will set you free, right? I mean, and the way you said, repentance unto life. Right? It really puts it in perspective, what, it, what it's talking about there. But I mean, I love what it says. About, I love what G, it, it says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He wasn't telling people to stop smoking and cussing and drinking and chewing and running with those who do those things. When he was preaching righteousness, that's not what he was talking about. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was preaching to the people the righteousness of God to save all of them from the death that sin is bringing. And that's why Noah was building this big ark. He was declaring the righteousness of God to save them from hell on earth, to save them from the effects of sin and death. And Jesus came. Jesus was the, uh, he is actually the preacher of righteousness. And what did Jesus say? In Psalm 40, I think he's talking to God, and he says, I haven't hid your righteousness in my heart, O God, but I've stood in the midst of the congregation and declared it. And so the midst of the congregation is us, guys. The world is the great congregation. So Jesus says, I know something about God and his goodness and his integrity and his faithfulness towards me. And I didn't leave it in my heart, God, but I stood in the midst of the world and told everyone about it. Now, how did Jesus get that right? What he did was he took our sin and death upon himself as he's hanging on the cross. And then we see what God does when he finds a guy beaten and bloodied and left on the road for dead by sin and death. He comes and raises that guy up and seats that guy at his right hand and clothes him with glory and immortality. So he was a preacher of the righteousness of God to save humans from sin and death. That's what Jesus was preaching in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. He was preaching the righteousness of God towards humans, even when they're dead in sin. So that we could see the same thing he saw about God. And that when we saw what he saw about God, we would say, this guy will clothe me. This guy will exalt me. This guy will preserve my life. This guy will bring forth peace and love and joy and kindness in me, not my flesh. And then we'd find ourselves resting in him. And that's how the whole thing happened. When you behold the way God will deal with the guy in sin and death, and you realize, oh, that was me. I was dead in sin. It it isn't just Jesus hanging on the cross. That's us. And so there we are, dead in our sin. And how does God deal with that guy? How does God deal with us when he finds us dead in our sin? What did he do? He come and bring the guy out of the grave. And wrapped, him, wrapped his mortal body in an imperishable body that could never die again. That's what we see about this guy. And now when we see that about that guy, and we see what he did to Jesus as what he intends to do with us, and that the only reason why he could even do it to Jesus is because that what was always in his heart to do to us. It changes our world view. It changes our belief about life. We begin seeing everything different. We're not living by an orphan spirit anymore. Jesus told the disciples when he was leaving them, I'm not going to leave you as orphans in the earth, but I'm going to send another, even the comforter. 
And he is the spirit of truth, and he will guide you into all the truth that is going to be revealed in me. Right? And so that's, that's how God changes your, your view on life, is he comes and shows you something about himself and his heart towards you. I love what Gary Venturella said the other night. And he's a, you know, he's a smart guy, and so he studies the scriptures um, sometimes looking for words that match. And he brought something out the other night in the Bible study. I wish he was here to explain it because he'd do it better than me. But he connected Jesus coming into the earth and Jesus saying, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I think it's very interesting Jesus calls himself the Son of Man there, right? We're all also the Son of Men, in case you didn't know. We're also the Son of Man. And so when Jesus says the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, he's kind of making a blanket statement about all people, right? And then what Gary brought out was at the cross, where right after Jesus cries out, Father, do you know what it says when he gave up the ghost? It says, he laid his head down to rest. <laughs> and so Jesus, listen, Jesus is the only one who's seen the heart of the Father. And so he laid his head down to rest in the bosom of the Father. Now, we were all a group of people who were living in the orphans. Orphan, orphans. We had nowhere to lay our head down to rest. Because we didn't know we were in the heart of the Father. We didn't know that his mind was filled full with us in our life. We didn't know his face shined in adoration of us. So we were like the Son of Man walking around with no place to lay our head down to rest. We were all the time thinking we were orphans and running around. But in Jesus crying out, Father, in the place of having sin and death, and his head going to rest in the Father, we can find something in us where we now, we do have a place to lay our head down to rest. And it's called the Father's heart. And when we see his heart for us, we'll find something dynamic happening in us where we lay our head down to rest. Do you see what I'm saying? When you, when you look in the Gospel of John, it says John leaned on the bosom of Jesus. He was the only one. He called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. You see, Jesus leaned on the Father's bosom like that. And that's the place that was always intended for all of us. His bosom was the place for all of us to lay down our head to go to rest. But we were running around like we had no place to lay our head down to rest. And then in Jesus, we see the place that we have is the Father's bosom. It's his heart. And when we see his heart for us, it's going to cause this thing in us where just like John leaned into Jesus's bosom, we'll find ourselves leaning into the father's bosom because we found a place to lay our head down to rest. Right. And we begin to know ourselves as the son or the daughter who the father loves. We're no longer thinking of God loves me. Yeah, 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 I know. But we're like, no, no, no. I'm the beloved son of God. I'm the beloved father or daughter of God. Do you see? That gives you a place to lay your head down to rest. <laughs> so it, it says, no man has seen the father but Jesus. He has been in his bosom. He has seen his heart. He's come to declare his heart to you. That's what it says there. And so Jesus come and just plop the father's heart out on the table for you. Not for like random, for you. God came and said, here's my heart for you. And he's looking you in the eyes. And he's trying to show you something that will cause you to see you do have a place to lay your head down to rest. And he doesn't just say, come. He brings it forth in you. He shows you something about his heart that kind of causes you to melt into his bosom. Right? And you feel, ah, oh, I have a place to rest. But Gary found that that was the only two places in the whole New Testament that Greek word was used. It was when he said the Son of Man has no place to lay his head down to rest. And then at the end, when he gives up the ghost, he says, Father, it says he laid his head down to rest. And it just goes to show the difference between a spiritual interpretation of the Scriptures and a carnal. Because most people, when they read that, when he, yeah. when he tells the disciples, the Son of Man has no place to rest, they thought he was speaking of himself. Yeah, and real to some degree he was, yeah, yeah. but he was speaking that the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, but he's going to lead you to a place where you can rest your, rest your head. Amen. That's it. But he was speaking what, actually of us. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> we, were, we felt like we were orphans in the earth, bereft of a father. Right. We thought our father came and saw us in the, the hospital and was like, no, nah, they're not mine. Look at him. 
They don't look like me. They don't smell like me. They don't, no, they're not mine. But God never did that, man. God never said we weren't his. That's not what God said. God, you know what God said? Something has found a way to infect the belief of our man. And now that thing is bringing forth death in the ones we want to spend all our days with. Let us redeem them from that death so we can have them living with us for all eternity. That's what God thought when he saw man dead in their sin. And you can go read Ezekiel 16, and it specifically says that. It says that, this is God talking in the first person. He says, behold, I walked by you, and you were in your blood. And you know what he says right after that? And behold, it was the time of love. I spread my skirt out over you. That's clothing. In the Jewish culture, when you get married, they spread a skirt. It means a specific thing. And so when it says, he walked by us and we were in our blood, blood is a sign of death. It says, behold, I make your, though your sin was as red as crimson, I made it as white as snow. What he's saying is, even though your sin was causing death to reign over you, I come and made your death as white as snow. And so when he says he walked by us in our blood, he's saying he saw us dead in our sin. And you know the thought that he had of us? They're not mine. No. Rejection. No. You know the thought he had? Behold, it's the time of love. (laughs) When we were at our worst, that's what the guy said. Behold, it is the time of love. Let us betroth ourselves unto them. That way their life can be made one with our life. And then they can find themselves raised up in overcoming the death that found a way into the world. That's what God's mind's been filled with this whole time. How can I redeem my people and this earth that I've created for them and for me? How can I redeem it back from death and reconcile it back to what was always in my heart in the beginning when we made everything? How can we do that? That's what God was always filled with. He wasn't busy thinking, well, we've got to change the nature of man, you know, because their nature is evil. No, no, no. You, you don't find Jesus talking about that at all. He came to redeem us from death and to redeem the earth from death. That's what he came to do. Right? He says we're the treasure in the field. He came to redeem something he saw great value in. When you look at the Jewish wedding culture, the groom and the father would come together and decide what the bride was worth. And then they would offer a payment to purchase the bride. That's how they would do it. And then the the father of the bride would agree or not agree. Well, Jesus is the groom and the father is the groom's, Jesus' father. And so they decided what we were worth. And you know what they decided? They looked around and said, there's nothing in creation. Even if we bring it all together as one, there's nothing that's as valuable as them. The only thing that can equal their value is us. So he come as a human. That's how compatible God is with human. He became one. <laughs> and then he, he died. That's the only thing that was as valuable. So the price God was willing to pay was himself. And that's speaking a direct word about the value he saw in man even when they were dead in their sin. He didn't think if I can clean them up enough, then I want to marry them. <laughs> Guys, how many of you did that with your wives when you found them? Did you go to it with your plan to clean, clean them up so that then they, you would want to marry them? How many of you think they would have accepted that proposal? <laughs> but that's what we've done with God. We think God looked at us and was disgusted by us and that he did something so he could make us tolerable to him. And now he can stand to look at us. Listen, man, that's what we've preached the gospel as. Marie's still trying to clean me up. <laughs> that's that is absolutely not true. But, I mean, that, that, that's kind of how we present no, the gospel. Uh, let me ask you a question. When John the Baptist was preaching to repent uh, before Jesus, what, 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 what did he mean by that? This is what John said to the Pharisees. He, he told them to come with fruit that was meat for repentance. And then he elaborates on that statement. Because he makes a point to explain, I ain't talking about your actions. 
He makes a point. Then he goes into, right after he says that, he says, and don't come saying or claiming Abraham as your father, as if that is the thing that you need. And so what he's talking about there is the Pharisees thought they would be justified through their flesh. They thought they were Jewish, and because they were, according to Abraham, physically, that that meant they were, they were in. And John the Baptist is preaching repentance from trusting in the flesh to be justified. That was his whole message. Repent from trusting in the strength of the flesh and believe on the lamb that's going to come and take away the sin of the world. And so the Pharisees were coming. He says, don't come, don't come without fruits meat for repentance. Meaning, don't come unless you're going to change your mind and turn away from trusting in the fact that you're Abraham's physical descendants. That wouldn't be repentance. That would still be trusting in the strength of the flesh. Because I'm physically a physical descendant of Abraham, that's going to justify me. John is talking about repent from that belief, man. That's the repentance John was talking about. He was all the time like a mad person out in the wilderness preaching that the strength of the flesh can't give life. God is sending a lamb, right? He was all the time preaching that. I've had people come here and tell, say that about this church. That we're like the one crying in the wilderness. <laughs> People will come to see. And they won't know what they came to see. <laughs> right? And I guess sometimes I feel like I'm kind of like an obscure type of person eating insects and stuff. <laughs> But that's what the repentance John was talking about. That's why he says, so many people take that and think, oh, but he was talking about their fruit would be good if they would. No, 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 no. Those guys were coming and claiming Abraham as their father for the reason why they were godly. And John was all the time preaching that you can't be godly through the strength of the flesh. Right? So don't come claiming Abraham as your father as if that's what makes you godly. Because God can even raise up children from these stones. <laughs> right? right? And that's what they were busy with. Jesus, when he had an interaction with the Pharisees, I think in John 6, they claimed Abraham as their father. Yes. That, that was, no, 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 we are in Abraham's our father. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, you're not of Abraham. If, you were, if Abraham was your father, you'd be of the same persuasion that Abraham was of. And you ain't. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. <laughs> well, they contrasted uh, Jesus and John the Baptist. They said, John the Baptist came to the eating and drinking, you know, and, and, uh, and then Jesus was both eating and drinking, you know what I mean? And, and so that, that was a statement about behavior, right? It's not about... It wasn't a statement about behavior. It was a statement about what was in people's hearts. Because John came observing all their, 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 the Nazarene rituals, which is what? He was a Nazarene of the Nazarene order. And they rejected his message. Jesus came doing all of it, and they rejected his message. Right? And so that's, that was the point there. The hypocrisy in their heart. Right? But they were preaching the same message. John, what does it say? Behold, one crying in the wilderness, pave ye the way of the Lord. And so John was coming to pave the way for the lamb that would come. And he was pointing everyone to believe on the lamb that would come. That's what he was busy doing. A lamb is coming. God's going to provide himself as the lamb. What did Abraham say when they said, Where, you're going up the mountain without a sacrifice? Yeah. And Abraham said, God will provide himself as the sacrifice. Yeah. So John is out in the wilderness yeah. talking about God going to provide himself as the lamb. And when he comes, I'm going to point at him and you're going to know. And that's who we're going to believe on for life. For he's going to be the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Meaning he's going to come and conquer our death. That's what it means to take away the sin of the world. We think God's busy trying to take away our bad behavior. He's busy trying to take away the death that found a way into the world. Because it's the death that's in the world that compels us to enlist our flesh for life. And if we enlist our flesh for life, no good thing can come out of our flesh. And so the way that this works is he come to conquer our death. And we see, my gosh, Jesus conquered death. And he's granted us immortality and glory and life as a gift by just believing on him. That puts our flesh to rest. Right? That's the thing that John was busy talking about. We need life. Death is reigning over us. God's going to provide himself as the lamb that's going to conquer our death. Oh, right? Now, when that lamb comes, believe on him. <laughs> I can imagine John thought that Jesus would be someone I mean, looking a zillion times more perfect like than he was as far as fasting and all the things he did. 
Could be, absolutely. Yeah, just, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And John, and, and, and just to encourage people, just because you feel confused sometimes doesn't mean you're somehow out of the loop or that you're being conquered or that you don't know the truth. John the Baptist come as the one paving the way for Jesus. He spent his whole life meditating with the Spirit about preaching about Jesus coming. And then when he found himself in jail, knowing he's going to be sacrificed soon, he found himself wondering if he missed it. <laughs> right? And so be encouraged, man. Just because you feel confused sometimes, it doesn't mean you've lost the plot. doesn't mean something's conquering you. doesn't mean God's far from you. It means sometimes there's things in this world that we encounter that can smack us in the face and make us think, that we're confused, we're lost, we don't know what we're thinking, we don't know what's going on, all those kinds of things. But just be of good cheer, man. God is with you. He's not far from you. Because he was Jesus' cousin, and he, he they grew up together. Yeah. There was only six months difference in their age. Yeah. And you know Mary said something about stuff that happened to you. Know, what God told her, and also, you would think, at least the close family members would have I get the impression they didn't really see each other that much. Yeah. It was just like Elizabeth knew, Mary knew, they probably did talk a little bit, but it didn't seem like they really grew up as you know, next door neighbors. Yeah, I can't. I mean, I, mean, I can't say that I studied it out exactly, but if my memory makes it seem like they weren't necessarily right next to each other, because I think it wasn't until six months that Mary was pregnant that she even saw Elizabeth. So they hadn't even seen each other, which would suggest that there might have been some type of distance. There was some distance. One lived in a different town. Yeah, and they didn't have cars and stuff, so... I mean, it might have taken a long time to get from one town to the next. You know what I'm saying? They didn't... You start conjecturizing about all that stuff, and it's like... It's just not... Hey, you know what's crazy? Well, you can't figure it out. Of all the Old Testament prophets, John the Baptist was the greatest. But then it says, but... He who is least in the kingdom of God is even greater than John the Baptist. Yeah. It makes you think, well, why is that? That's a good question. Why is that? Because of the giving of the Spirit. <laughs> Everyone I, in this room. Think, I, I mean, I think it's that, but it's even more. It's that we are now able to, to look upon the Son of Man crucified and raised from the dead. Listen, what we, what we know and have experienced from God is far greater than... John in his flesh yeah. had received. Yeah. So, there's no question. Well, the Holy Spirit hasn't descended to do this. Yeah. Right. No. But see that but I, I look at it as that's why the the spirit can um what does it say about the spirit um was poured out on all flesh. Yeah. Well how was it able to be poured out on all flesh? Because a man died away the sin of the world and was resurrected as a message about all flesh. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, how could it have been poured out? You couldn't re- it was hard for them to relate to it. How can I believe into that? You, you can't. God can't the only way God could pour out his spirit and, and make it available for all flesh is if a human who came in the likeness of Adam there's the first Adam and the last Adam. He needed a human that was the representative head of the entire human race that had dominion over the earth and had authority over all flesh. That's why John, Jesus, or John 17, it talks about Jesus. I have, you've given me authority over all flesh. And so in that place, God needed for a human, even with the sin and the death of the world on him, to rest in God for life. And if a human could do that, Meaning they didn't trust in their own works. They were without sin. That's what it would mean to be without sin. Jesus didn't try to clothe himself when the first Adam did. And so when Jesus did that as a human, this human believed on the spirit of God for life. And he was the representative head of the human race. Now God, when he sat that human at his right hand, could pour out his spirit on all flesh. And we can look upon that word. We can look on that word and find the same thing happen. See, if Adam had believed on God in the beginning. He was also the representative head of the human race. If, and he, he had dominion over the whole earth. It, in the place of Eve eating from the tree, if Adam would have said, Father, Eve is eating from the tree, 
She's dying, man. We, I don't want her to die. I don't want to see her perish. And if Adam would have cried out to God and believed on the spirit of God for life, then the earth and all of creation and Adam and Eve would have been baptized in the glory of God. Boom! The spirit would have been poured out on all flesh. And Eve would have been left. Well, we could debate about that, how that would work. I, I wouldn't say that. She... I, I say that to mean like God didn't want one person. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. But that's, that's the, the, the thing with the Spirit being poured out and God needing a human to believe to pour it out. Yeah. And Jesus come as that human and believed when the first Adam didn't, right? It's Th- powerful when you look at it like that, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely, you know, absolutely. I mean, the Spirit isn't like some hocus pocus. Oh, I have the Spirit. No, you are beholding the word of the Spirit. You know, you're beholding yes. the truth. Yeah, it's not just like we some... can relate to it, you know what I mean? Yes. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We can relate to it. It's good to think of it that way. You're right. It's not some hocus pocus. That's the Spirit the, is a the, word the, that we can relate to. And that word was made flesh. And John says it's not intangible. He said we held it, we touched it, we ate with that word. He's talking about the Spirit, right? We can grab on to the Spirit of truth. It's been revealed in Jesus but that's why the, the scriptures talk about the first Adam and the last Adam. That's one of the reasons. That's why it talks about God reconciled all things back to himself in Christ. Because God had a plan for heaven and earth to become one. He had a plan for man to be glorified and mortal. He had a plan for all of creation to be glorified and mortal. And then he would walk with man in the cool of the day for all eternity, loving them. That was his plan. But he needed a human who had dominion over the earthly realm to believe on his spirit for life. And Adam didn't eat from the tree of life. He ate from the tree that brings death. And so Jesus comes as a human in the likeness of the first Adam, having dominion over everything. And he believed on the spirit. So he reconciled the earth and all the people who will believe on Jesus back to God's original plan. Right. And so there's coming a day where Jesus is coming back. He's bringing heaven with them and heaven and earth are going to collide. And this earth is going to be baptized immortal just like in acts when the holy spirit came down and they had the little flames over their head you guys remember that that little flame was a picture it's a sign and a wonder testifying of god baptizing our mortal bodies in glory and fire and immortality when jesus comes back he's going to bring heaven with him the earth is going to be baptized and glorified immortal and so will all the people who believed on jesus poof not to throw a monkey wrench in the conversation but uh before Adam and Eve ate of the tree, was it possible for Adam to have fallen off a cliff, broken his neck, and died? Or for Eve to fall into one of the rivers and drown? Well, I mean, to be, people could speculate about that kind of a thing. I'm just um, curious. And I'm going to tell you what my view, yeah. um, without getting into too many details. For me, Adam and Eve did possess the ability to die before they ate from the tree. Um, because an immortal can't die. And so the very fact that God told them they could die if they eat this tree tells me that they possessed something where their bodies could perish. Now, I don't know about the falling off of of a ledge kind of a thing or drowning in a river. I don't know about that. But for me, their bodies did possess the ability to perish because they did. And Jesus's body doesn't possess the ability to perish anymore. Right. And if you if you study it out and read like the ancient Jewish Um, writings about it they believe God created Adam with the ability to either transcend his natural state or return to the dust of the ground that's what they believed that if Adam would to use Jewish language Before before the fall that if Adam would believe on Torah then he could rise above his natural state and that he would be in the image and likeness of God but if he didn't believe on Torah then he would return to the dust of the ground. So in Christ, we have irreversible life. Right. And that, that's what God was busy with all the way from the beginning. He's still doing it now. I preached a whole message about why, what do we need to be saved from. Adam needed to be saved before he sinned. Right. Why did God warn him about the tree? Right. Well, but let me just say this. It's a, let me tell you why conjecturizing is so, like, unprofitable. The, the reality is this. Are you going to conjecture that, about that? Um, no, no, no. no I'm, I'm not going to conjecture about this, but I'm, I'm going to make a statement that if they wouldn't have eaten this from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, 
they would have eaten from the tree of life and lived forever. Yeah. It was one or the other. So whether prior to their eating of any tree in the center of the garden, they could have perished, is kind of like inconsequential. A choice was going to be made. You don't think and they when were they, eating? And when, and, the, and when they ate, they were either going to eat from the tree of life and have lived forever, or eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Did the tree of life give them eternal life before the fall, or was it just daily life? Well, that's, that's conjecturizing. Yeah. Also, they, ate every they, day. They, they, were, they were somewhat, I don't want to say, well, this is where you get into the, all the conjecturizing, but the reality is they were predestined in that this is the way it happened to go. You understand what I'm saying? Not predestined to necessarily choose one over the other, but they were predestined because this is the way it went, to have eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So to conjecturize what would have happened if they would have done it the other way and all of that, it, it really is unprofitable because they didn't do it that way. They did it this they way. They didn't do it and, that way. And now we have to deal with the consequences of that and, and move on from that. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it might be fun to talk about that stuff, but it really, yeah. there's no answer to some of those like whether things. Adam had a belly button. Yeah. But I mean, they ate every day. So. <laughs> I think we ought listen, to have it, a it, 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 first meal. Right? Listen, it, it doesn't say that they ate from the tree of life every day. The, the tree of life represents believing on the spirit for life. Right. They did not believe on the spirit right. for life. They believed on their works for life, and they perished. Okay? okay? That it's Jesus came, he saw the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He ate from the tree of life and he was glorified and mortal. Right? Yeah. And so the original question about Adam, did he possess the ability to perish? I think the scriptures teach that he does. On the surface, it might seem like an unimportant point, but if as you keep moving down the line, if you believe Adam was created immortal, then you start defining death as only a spiritual thing and not a physical thing. And then it lends itself down the road to Gnosticism and all types of crazy beliefs about Jesus wasn't really raised in a body. He doesn't have a body now. It, it, it kind of like thwarts the power of the resurrection. It causes you to, to count immortality as a common thing. Right, where you kind of say, I'm going to live forever anyway, so who cares? But I agree with what Marie said. Exactly, it can exactly. be fun to talk about where that. Where does it go? But if we get lost in, in all of that, yeah. then yeah, it just. Yeah. That's that monkey wrench. Yeah. yeah. That's like that thing where um, the scripture says, um, what you, in Genesis, it says, you shall, be, you shall leave his father and mother and be joined to Eve, Adam should. Well, he didn't have a father and mother. God was his parent. Right. But it was kind of funny that they put them. He, he'll leave his, they'll leave their father and mother and become one flesh. And, you know, be married, in other words. Uh, but they didn't have a mother and father, so the belly button thing, if they weren't born of a woman, then they wouldn't have had a belly button. Oh. That's it. There, there, we solved the problem. <laughs> I'm free. I'm glad you straightened that out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <goodness. laughs> uh, glory to God, guys. It's okay. 11. Yeah. If anybody wants to hang out, I'm going to hang out for a while. If anybody wants to talk about some if things. If anybody's interested, they got the dog parade. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The dog parade. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for, for, for adding and talking and sharing. And I like the new format. 